Speaker. And I find myself, um, to my, my shock and surprise, I suppose, agreeing with an awful lot of what the Honourable Lady from Putney had said uh, in, in her speech. Um, it's just a shame that in a lot of the things that she said, that her government has no intention of doing any of these things and there is no evidence that they will do any of these things, um, despite her, her best efforts. And in many cases, it is actually quite the opposite in terms of what this government has done to people um, right across these islands. And the points that she made about the, the Treasury running a separate um, policy to the Prime Minister, uh, about the, the, the sort of need for investment um, in the long term rather than a year-to-year -year, um, type of investment, I, I agree wholeheartedly with. These things need to see change. Um, again, the government seems intent on, uh, on having reviews that go nowhere as delaying tactics and, and not in investing in that long term. And of course, as my intervention would suggest, that has a knock-on effect on the Scottish Government and their ability to do the things that they want to go on with and do, because there is that ongoing uncertainty about budgets. There is the the sort of the wait, the lag time between what the UK government announces in its budget and then what the Scottish government has to do with that money. There's things like the implications of the Barnet formula, whether things go up or down in the UK, depending, uh, determining what the Scottish government has left to, to spend, which is, adds to the unpredictability um, of the Scottish budget and of Scottish priorities within that as well, because the priorities of the Scottish government are not necessarily anywhere near the priorities of the UK government who sets that budget and who determines how that money uh, will flow. So I think there is a huge amount that needs to change um, from the UK in terms of how things are done. Um, but unfortunately, as I said, I don't see uh, things changing uh, any time soon. And the Social Mobility Commission's State of the Nation reports pr uh, provides a further damning indictment on the UK government because they found that social mobility has stagnated over the last four years at virtually all stages from birth to work. And this is not a huge surprise to anybody, as poor social mobility has a close relationship with income inequality and indicated that the UK has consistently failed to improve upon. The UK is the fifth most unequal country in Europe when it comes to income, according to the Institutes for Public Policy Research. Of course, income inequality is not an issue that is exclusive to the UK, and global trends are pointing towards inherited wealth increasing faster than earned income. And sustained efforts are required to get rid of the sticky floor, which makes it incredibly difficult for people to climb out of poverty. The OECD estimate it will take five generations for children in poverty in the UK to reach average income, which is a sobering statistic uh, and gives no prospect of things changing uh, soon. And I have uh, raised some of the issues uh, surrounding the tax system before in this place. And the tax system in the UK is just not fit to tackle big issues such as income equality and social mobility. It's un unwieldy, unnecessarily complex and full of holes uh, to hide in. And this UK government have provided a catalogue of tax reliefs for those who are already wealth wealthy. And a report by Tax Justice has illustrated this issue extremely well. They found that wealthy families are substantially reducing their inheritance tax obligations by invoking tax reliefs on the value of agricultural and business property. And the combined cost of this particular tax relief was £390 million last year, equivalent to the cost of employing 23,000 NHS nurses. Uh, and 930 million can buy a lot of things. It's nearly the cost of the expected savings to the government of the two-child limit and universal credit. So it's extremely telling, Mr Robertson, that this government will prioritise tax breaks for the very wealthy while simultaneously cutting support for children at the lowest end of the income scale, those who need it the very most. And the Honourable Member from Strangford was absolutely correct in what he said, pointing out the, the gender gap within social mobility and black and minority ethnic communities as well. And that is uh, writ large across the statistics and it is writ large um, in the people that I see at my surgeries as well. And he was correct to say that um, tax credits are a great boost to many people uh, when they are done right. And he is also correct to point out that those wishing to better themselves within this um, bizarre structure that the UK government has, um, has put together, that those wishing to better themselves and improve their lives have lost out. And Within my, my own family, um, my papa Thulis uh, studied, he went to night school um, and, and did the best that he could for his family and that is essentially uh, part of the reason that I am here today, that my grandparents uh, were willing to put uh, that investment into their children so that my parents could be the first in their families to go to university, essentially so that, that I could be here today. And Mr Robertson, my grand turns 99 on Saturday and it was with some satisfaction I think that she sees um, what has happened within her family. Um, that has got me here today. 
But that structure has to be in place for social mobility to happen. University has to be affordable. Apprenticeships have to be supported and achievable. And that is not always there for too many people. And the point about the Honourable Member for Strangford made about uh, apprenticeships and about other things um, being accessible and the, the point the Honourable lady, lady made about people being able to travel to reach those apprenticeships uh, is important. And I would add that what is also important that apprentices are able to get a real living wage because the wage level, the minimum apprentices uh, are entitled to earn is a pittance. And you cannot expect people to put their lives on hold for the pittance as an apprenticeship wage. There needs to be more support put into real living costs because those apprentices have bills to pay, have families to support, and that needs to be part of the package as well. And the social contract has been ripped up for people who need it the most. We saw last month's report by Philip Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur, that austerity has decimated the lives of many people and actively pushed them into poverty. And the UK government said this kind of fiscal discipline is vital to reduce the deficit and build a strong economy. But that, that need for fiscal discipline evaporates completely uh, when it comes to tax breaks for the wealthy or spending billions of pounds on Brexit preparations or putting nuclear weapons on the Clyde. And it's not difficult to come to the conclusion that these cuts were never actually about reducing the deficit and they are ideologically driven. And we're seeing even more blatant rhetoric coming from the Tory leadership race with the Honourable Member for Uxbridge and South Rouselip uh, promising a huge cut in income tax for the highest earners if he is elected. And the Fraser Valander Institute at Strathclyde University in my constituency has hinted at the impact that this will have on the Scottish budget because, because of the devolution of income tax, the tax cut wouldn't apply in Scotland, but the budget cuts would, um, that would come as a result of this. But, and also that uh, national insurance to pay for this would increase, and that will have an impact because that is reserved. Scotland has no control over national insurance. So we will lose out on budget because of this policy, uh, and our national insurance contributions from people in Scotland would increase. Now, if I had the opportunity to give an extra £6,000 a year to one group of people, it certainly would not be to those earning over £80,000 a year. It would be to some of the families rendered destitute by the hostile environment policy that my office has to source school uniforms, food bank vouchers and Christmas presents for year in, year out in some cases. Or for the women that are victims of domestic abuse having to declare that their third child was born as a result of rape just to put food on the table. Or to the people who have disabilities we have to be hauled through a degrading and inhumane assessment system at the risk of being threatened with sanctions. These are the people in society, Mr Robertson, who desperately need that break, who desperately need that £6,000. And that is a choice that those leadership candidates are putting forward. That is a choice that they would bring into government um, if selected. My colleagues in the SNP benches and I have consistently called for devolution of all welfare powers, as well as for inheritance tax and other types of tax to be devolved, so that the Scottish Government can get on with the job of tackling income equality. We've already created in Scotland the first Scottish income tax system, the fairest in the UK, and this system has meant that 55% of Scots pay less tax, at the same time raising £68 million for public services. The same report I referred to earlier by the Social Mobility Commission, which was so damning for the UK government, congratulated the Scottish government on the work that they've been doing to increase social mobility. And the report says that Scotland is going against the UK trend and becoming more socially mobile. And I would urge the, the, uh, the Honourable Member from Putney to have a look at uh, what Scotland is doing in this regard. Because a person's social, socioeconomic status is now less likely to be determined by their parents' socioeconomic status. The likelihood of being in a professional job has narrowed over the past few years between those from a working class and a professional background from 28 percentage points in 2014 to 23 percentage points. And the Scottish Government have also um, tried to tackle the issue of people from uh, different social and economic backgrounds getting to university. And there's been a huge amount of work done in this regard to switch uh, that trend. And I also want to pay credit to businesses, um, as the Honourable Member for Putney did, who are involved in this uh, initi kind of initiative as well. And I visited Zurich in my constituency, who are taking more people now straight from school um, into the insurance sector, um, recognising that having a degree isn't necessarily what they need in their business, but they need that rounded range of skills um, in order to have a better business. And they have found it hugely beneficial to bring people from school for that. Absolutely. I'm sure she'll be pleased to hear also that Standard Life Aberdeen is another company that is very much walking the talk and genuinely making an impact that goes well beyond its employees into the wider community. I would agree, and there are great examples of businesses right across the board. I could stand here all afternoon, <laughs> till the afternoon, I suppose, and, and talk about those. Um, but it's good to see Standard Life Aberdeen doing that. 
and more and more businesses are recognising that actually seeing a uh, degree level on their job apl um, application uh, and job adverts isn't actually necessary in a lot of cases. Uh, and by removing that and looking at much wider at the range of skills that people can bring rather than um, what degree they have or haven't got um, will increase social mobility and it's definitely to be commended. The Scottish Government are pursuing an inclusive growth agenda and tackling, um, view tackling inequality and growing in the economy as two sides of the same coin, uh, which I'm sure the Honourable Member for Putney uh, would agree with, given her speech. And I think it's important to think about the type of society we're creating with economic policies and to consider what the point of growth is if it's built on the backs of the most vulnerable. The Scottish Government have invested in decreasing, in, in decreasing child poverty with an ambitious target to reduce it to 10% by 2030. And they've introduced a legal requirement on public sector bodies aimed at reducing socio-economic disadvantage. And fundamentally, Mr Robertson, the Scottish Government are opposed to Brexit, which continues to threaten the hard-fought steps uh, towards uh, reducing inequalities. Mr Robertson, the Honourable Member for Putney laid out the dysfunctionality of the British state in great detail. And this is what we see from Scotland. And increasingly people in Scotland do not believe that the British state will work for them. We have tried, we have waited, we have looked uh, for changes to come, and those changes have not come. And in fact, Mr Robertson, looking at it, this from a socialist perspective, we can only see this getting worse. Um, we have asked for more powers for Scotland to, to try to tackle these things, but we do not have yet the full levers of power, the full levers uh, that we would have as an independent nation where we can actually uh, tackle inequality head-on using the full range of powers uh, that we would have as an independent country. The UK government has abdicated time and time again their responsibility to the most vulnerable people, and if they can't do that job, Mr Robertson, they should allow Scotland to have the powers to do that instead. Um, to you, Mr. Robertson, it's an absolute privilege to serve under your chairmanship. 